we are happy to see uh, so many people interested in being here for this discussion today and for coming in to the RAIN, to the Global Security Forum. My name is Rebecca Hersman. I am the director of the Project on Nuclear Issues and a senior advisor in the International Security Program here at CSIS and very much want to welcome you here to our panel discussion on nuclear consensus busters. The question put before us today is can bipartisan support for nuclear modernization survive Putin, Kim Jong-un, and the next NPR? I do have the responsibility to remind you all we take uh, safety very seriously in the building, especially when we have such a large crowd. Uh, for this session, I am your designated safety officer. Um, we have exits directly this way um, and out down the stairs, or if necessary, we can always exit out the back. Um, staff are around the room to assist if for any reason uh, we heard announcements and were directed to respond. We feel very safe in the building, but part of our practices are to make sure we remind you every time of what we need to do if in case we need to respond in some way. Um, I would also mention that today's panel is on the record being live streamed um, and it will be available on the CSIS website following the event. If you're tweeting, please feel free to use the hashtag CSIS GSF 2017. So thank you very much for coming out in the rain and supporting the Global Security Forum uh, with all of the International Security Program team and the rest of CSIS. And we're thrilled so many of you want to come and talk about nuclear policy. We do think the topic is incredibly important. Um, nuclear rhetoric has been running pretty high. The Trump administration's nuclear posture review is nearing completion this fall. And we can all detect, I think, um, a degree of hand-wringing as to the future of the fragile political consensus that has supported the comprehensive modernization of the U.S. nuclear complex. So what we decided to do was to take some four of the thorny issues that perhaps, some say, could threaten that consensus and look for a range of views, both on the importance of that consensus how it can be preserved, and the extent to which significant movement on one or more of these topics might threaten it. Our panelists are going to ad address each of these four topics in turn. We'll go kind of e through each one, and then we'll open up for questions. The first topic is legislation to limit presidential power regarding nuclear command and control. The second will be the issue of colloquially referred to as mini nukes, but basically the issue of whether or not we should adapt, modify, or modernize our nuclear warheads in such a way that the three no's of the prior administration might um, need to be put aside in whole or in part. We will ask them about the possible deployment of additional tactical nuclear capabilities, or at least non-strategic nuclear capabilities in either Europe or South Korea and the extent to which we should consider additional arms control, including the further extension of New START, uh, while INF uh, noncompliance remains such a significant issue. I recognize that's a lot of ground to cover. We won't be able to cover the details or the background on each one of these, but hopefully give you some sense of teaser of how important these issues are, what do they mean in the broader political context for supporting nuclear modernization. Fortunately, we have three outstanding people here today to help us address this issue. Uh, we have to my left, James Acton, who is the co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program and a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's a physicist by training. Um, he works on a number of projects, including uh, a new uh, grant project on new technologies and nuclear threats. Uh, he's, he's published extensively including Carnegie reports on the international security implications of Japanese domestic politics, at least two books on nuclear disarmament, um, and a host of other studies and analyses, and he's testified and presented uh, extensively. Uh, he may be a familiar face to all of you. John Harvey is the former Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Chemical and Biological Defense Programs. He has a long um, history inside the biz, you might say, in both the defense side and the uh, DOE um, and NSA side of our nuclear enterprise. He served as uh, Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary, where he advised on plans, policies, and oversight of the U.S. nuclear weapons program. Prior to 2009, he served as a Director of Policy Planning Staff of NNSA, where he advised the Administrator on major policy program decisions. 
From 1995 to 2001, he served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Nuclear Forces and Missile Defense Policy. So really has touched most of the bases inside the government. And then all the way to my right, we have Rebecca Heinrichs from the Hudson Institute. She is a senior fellow with the Hudson Institute. She specializes in nuclear deterrence, missile defense, and counterproliferation. I'm sure you've seen her work there or her prominent presence in a number of news and media outlets where she speaks to these issues frequently. She has served as an advisor on military and foreign policy issues to Representative Trent Franks. She's testified before Congress and made numerous presentations um, and, again, is, is kind of well known in the field. So we've got a lot of expertise and a wide range of views here at the table. So we thought it would be useful to really circle to this uh, challenge overall. So what I'd like to do is, without much more um, discussion from me, turn to the first question. Legislation to limit presidential powers regarding nuclear command and control, especially in terms of inserting a specific role for Congress in the event of any sort of first use of a nuclear weapon, has been pretty hotly discussed and debated, and there's been some pending legislation on the Hill as well. Views are pretty strong on both sides of this issue, and what I'd like to do is get the take of our panelists on this first topic of how significant is this, how threatening is it to consensus, how important is that? With that, James, what I'd like to do is turn to you first. Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. And it's a, a, a great pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation uh, and also to speak on a panel with my colleagues and friends. Um, let me say one general comment before I dig down into this. Um, I genuinely think it is in the interest of the nation to try and forge a consensus on where we're going with nuclear policy. Uh, that, that consensus has been fragile, but it's been there. And that consensus requires arms controllers to accept aspects of modernization they don't like and uh, deter us, as it were, to accept aspects of arms control they may not otherwise like. Uh, but I feel that that consensus is important to build and maintain. Let me turn to the specific issue of uh, legislation to uh, uh, curtail the president's ability to use nuclear weapons first. Um, my personal view on this is that no president should have the authority uh, to use no one person, whoever that is, should have the authority to use nuclear weapons first, absent an imminent nuclear threat. That said, I think the legislation that's currently before Congress, the Marquis Lou bill, is exactly the wrong way to proceed on this issue. Um, in large part because uh, whoever the president is, any legislation to try and uh, curtail the president's power on this issue is just going to be seen as partisan politics. Um, and the odds of actually making progress on this issue legislatively, I think, are virtually close to zero. So you have almost no chance of achieving anything, um, and you potentially cause a lot of partisan rancor in the process. Uh, and by the way, I think it's actually a bad idea for Congress to be the stop on the president's use of nuclear weapons. Um, my own personal view on this, for what it's worth, in terms of a way that could precede consensus to continue, is look, if you wanted to get legislation passed, you'd need the president to sign it anyway. If the president were willing to sign the legislation, why wouldn't that president be willing to uh, commission a review of whether, that pre of whether the president should have the sole authority uh, to use nuclear weapons first, absent an imminent nuclear threat? So that's what I think this president or a future president should do, just review the issue um, uh, administratively. Uh, my own personal preference would be to say that the president and two out of three senior cabinet members, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of State, and the Attorney General would have to agree to the use of nuclear weapons. That's my own personal model that I would prefer, but I wouldn't try to do that legislatively. Thank you very much. John, could I turn to you on this question? I very much agree with, thank you, Rebecca. I very much agree with uh, James that uh, bipartisan consensus on modernization is critical. After all, these programs are going to play out over several Congresses and multiple presidential administrations. And if we don't have agreement on them, uh, they will uh, uh, run the risk of being um, whipsawed back and forth uh, at the change of every administration. Regarding the legislation requiring congressional authorization prior to nuclear employment, or a more structured dual key arrangement, I think these ideas are, are bad, perhaps for some of the same reasons that James does and perhaps for a few others. Uh, during the Cold War, the U.S. maintained capabilities for a rapid launch 
of ICBMs is a critical component of deterrence. No Soviet leader could count on presidential delay in responding to a large-scale initial attack that put uh, the U.S. fixed ICBM force at risk. This was seen as a critical component of deterrence in, in, in that it complicated an attacker's planning. To be clear, this was an option available to the president, not a policy for rapid launch. The president could still decide to, to ride out an attack before responding. President Obama, as other presidents before him, was not comfortable with the possibility that he would be called on to launch nuclear weapons rapidly on, on warning of attack. He asked for a review of options to increase decision time for responding to any such attack. Options range from a means uh, to increase warning time, for example, for a short flight time sea launch cruise missile nuclear attack launched from coastal, U.S. coastal waters, uh, or uh, as well as uh, more survivable ICBMs, which is a historical um, uh, quest that we have not never succeeded in. In the end, the president decided to maintain and exercise the capability to carry out a rapid launch, again as a means to complicate an adversary's attack plan, but he also continued to press for reduced reliance on such an option. Regarding dual key, today the president and only the president is authorized to ex execute nuclear forces. The proposed legislation originates from members of Congress concerned that the current president is not to be trusted with solely his finger on the nuclear trigger. Of course, the president would be inclined to confer with his senior military and civilian advisors before ordering a launch. That said, a dual key arrangement where, for example, the Secretary of Defense must formally concur with a presidential launch order is not desirable. Among other things, it might convince a Russian leader or an adversary that it could take out U.S. ICBMs in initial strike before we could respond. Bottom line, if you don't trust the guy with his finger on the nuclear trigger, then work to defeat him at the polls, rather than mess with what remains, according to national security experts on both sides of the aisle, an important component of U.S. deterrence. Thank you. Rebecca. Great. Well, um, thank you, Rebecca, for the invitation to be here, and thank you all for coming and joining us on this cold day to um, talk about these critically important issues. So um, it, is, it is a pleasure to be here with, uh, with my colleagues as well. Um, uh, so uh, this particular issue gets at the heart of executive authority. So it's not just nuclear weapons. It's just what, what powers does the President of the United States as Commander-in-Chief have? Um, that's already written into the Constitution. So um, uh, of the issues that we have considered before us, uh, to, to my mind, this one was, was the most, um, this is a non-starter. Uh, we're not going to limit the President's ability to, uh, to use the force that he deems prudent and necessary to protect the American people. And it doesn't matter if there's a Democrat in, um, in the White House or a Republican. Um, and so I, I would just agree with, my, um, with uh, Dr. Harvey here that there really are three ways to prevent um, an individual that you see as unfit to have this in incredible uh, power and authority. And the first one is elections. And, and really, this comes at the heart of um, this particular issue has been raised because of just how politically uh, divisive um, uh, this, this election cycle has been. Um, and that's, that, that's why, and, and I agree uh, certainly with, with James that um, the, the, the legislative vehicle that's being considered, the legislation, is, is very, very political, and so it's not going to go anywhere. Um, but I do think that there, it's fruitful to, to, to have this, uh, this conversation. Um, and then the second way, of course, uh, that if Congress really is um, fearful of the current president who, who was duly elected, um, ability to have this authority and to wield it wisely and prudently, um, they can cut funds. Uh, they, can, they, have the, they have the power of the purse, the legislative body. That, that's what Congress, that's the power that it has over the executive branch. And so if you're concerned about any particular authority or ability the president has, you can withhold funds. I understand that's difficult to do. It was designed that way. Um, and then, of course, the third way is you can impeach the president. 
Um, but those really are the three mechanisms that we currently have um, at our disposal if you really think that the president should not have this ability. Um, but the president has this authority, um, and the reason that he is the sole, um, uh, ha does have the sole authority, is, um, is, is for speed, is the purposes of speed, making quick decisions. And, and so that's why it's there. And so of the, of the four that I, I see um, before us, I, I think this one is the one that has the least chance of, of sort of moving or going anywhere. Um, and, and then just because this is a young audience too, just for those who are more interested in just looking at sort of uh, constitutional authorities that are vested in the president, um, you know, the, the founders had this robust discussion. Of course, this was predating nuclear weapons, um, but you can look in the Federalist Papers. Um, Hamilton's most famous um, paper was Federalist Number 74, where he talks about the importance of the, of the president having that um, great authority as commander in chief and all of the authority in terms of conducting war um, being vested in the executive branch. So I'll just close out there. All right. Well, that to me sounds like, and we may take a poll from the audience, but it sounds like we have uh, varying degrees of it, the expression of reservation about this item, a general agreement that if it were to proceed, it would definitely bust consensus. Um, and uh, even if it were to proceed, probably needs some revision to take into account both political and operational practicalities. So let's move on to the next one, um, which may in some ways be a bit more before us and involves a bit more subtlety. And that is this issue of the kind of fundamental uh, policy elements of the last nuclear posture review, which included um, some policy, let's call them sort of pronouncements or understandings that are kind of now sort of summarized in the form of what we call the three no's. No new warheads, no new missions, and no new military capabilities for existing weapons. Now, of course, even within those, there's a little bit of room for interpretation, um, but I think there is sort of a general understanding of what those no's meant. Um, what I'm gonna do this time is start from the other side of the table, if I may, um, but to what extent you know, are these items, if we move from the current stated policy, to what extent is that necessary and appropriate? To what extent does it threaten consensus? And how important should that be? So Rebecca, I'll start with you this time. Sure, um, first of all, um, I would agree that consensus, consensus is important. Consensus is, it, it is important. Um, uh, but I would also say that just as in the previous administration, um, it, it pushed, it, it did push the envelope on, um, on where the consensus was. And I think the three no's is, is one of those issues. Um, when, when this was included um, in, uh, in the Obama administration, um, there was a lot of people who had some serious problems with it. So this was sort of, I, I don't know if I would call it, I think I would call it, I would call this one, this was a consensus busting issue, I think, at the time. Um, and, and this really, this one of all of them, really, I think, gets at the heart of, the, of a sort of, um, what is the role of nuclear weapons? And if you start from the premise that the role of nuclear weapons um, is deterrence, um, assurance, and uh, damage limitation, but mainly dam uh, deterrence and assurance, damage limitation. And then, as in the last NPR, um, really another issue that was brought um, as a priority was uh, nonproliferation as a sort of um, goal in the nuclear posture review. Um, and um, so if you go back to those, sort of the primary goal of nuclear weapons, you might come to a different conclusion about what is the best means to achieve that. Under the Obama administration, these three no's were part of that. Um, um, so having said that, now that we are many, many years since this was first introduced, um, I do think that it is important to uh, maintain the current nuclear modernization plan that was uh, begun by the Bush administration, that was supported by the Obama administration, and that is now, again, supported by the Trump administration, and we should be getting underway. Um, and from, from what I see, and from, and from um, uh, uh, those who continue to testify before Congress, it is sufficient to, to get the United States where we need to be for the current nuclear force. Um, so, 
I don't think there's a need to go forward with a new nuclear weapon at this point um, or a new capability, et cetera, now within my own definition of what those mean. So um, the LRSO, for instance, I would say doesn't fit that breaking those three no's. Um, the GBSD, of course, doesn't break those three no's. And so I'm talking about the current nuclear modernization um, of record uh, that, that is currently there. Um, now, as a matter of policy, if this current administration did not include the three no's in its nuclear posture review, um, that is the prerogative of this new administration, just as it was the prerogative of the previous administration. Um, and, and if I may, um, I know I'm talking, taking a little bit more time here, um, I thought this, this was a great quote by, by General Selva. Um, he said, if the only options we have are to go with high yield weapons that create a level of indiscriminate killing that the president can't accept, then we haven't presented him with an option to respond to a nuclear attack in kind. Um, and so he's talking again about the low yield uh, uh, tactical nuclear weapon at that point. And, and so you have an administration now that has a, has a fundamentally, I think, different understanding about what is going to be required to give the president credible, reliable options for deterrence. That is the prerogative of this administration, and so I would be supportive of that. Um, but, but, but again, if we, if, you know, for an introduction of a completely new nuclear weapon with a completely new uh, mission, um, I don't see any reason at this point um, to move forward with that. I haven't, I haven't seen that. Um, and so I do think um, maintaining that consensus now that we have, I think, makes sense to carry along um, the Democrats in Congress who support the current modernization program. James. Thanks. Um, so the, um, um, the, the impression I have of the state of the nuclear posture review is there is consideration at the moment of a lower yield option in the form of a primary only um, Trident D5. That's been reported in The Guardian. There's some other uh, options under consideration. I think this would be a significant mistake. Firstly, we already have a low yield option. Okay, this always gets missed in the debate. The B61 gravity bomb reportedly has an option well underneath one kiloton. We already have a low yield option, and we're spending a lot of money on delivery systems to ensure that can penetrate. And I just don't see a, a military need that needs to be filled by a new capability or by changing an existing capability to give it a low yield option. Moreover, I think it's a big mistake to start down this route. Um, since the end of the Cold War, uh, those administrations that have wanted to develop new capabilities have had exactly zero success in trying to do so. The reliable replacement warhead, the robust nuclear earth penetrator, I mean, these names that may be familiar to some of you from the Bush administration simply never got funded, even at times when there was, you know, Republicans controlling different branches of Congress as well as the White House. And I think there is a real risk here, and the risk is what are we going to prioritize? Take you back to when New START was signed in 2009, and the Obama administration made promises about the amount of money it was going to spend on the nuclear enterprise. Uh, in the case of NNSA, why did that money not come through in full? Okay? It wasn't because the Obama administration didn't request the money. It was because the appropriators on the Energy and Water Subcommittee, both Democrats and Republicans, decided they would rather spend money not on NNSA, but in large-scale water projects in their own district. Okay? That's why you go on to energy and water appropriations. It's not because you care deeply about NNSA. It's because you want water projects. And as a result, really important parts of NNSA, particularly def uh, 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 the urgently needed upgrades to antiquated facilities um, have proceeded much slower than they should have done. And I think the big risk here with, 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 with trying to ask for new capabilities is that the time you could spend, the effort you could spend, the limited political capital you could spend trying to convince uh, appropriators to spend money on high priority items inevitably get direct, redirected to lower priority and, in my opinion, unnecessary items. You know, in the real world of Washington politics, actually 
prioritizing your ability to convince, to convince Congress, focusing your efforts on what's important, on the highest priority, I think is critically important. And, if we f and, and, and I think asking for, new, for, for, for money for modifying existing capabilities or for new capabilities is simply going to lead to higher priority stuff being neglected. So how do you maintain consensus on this issue? Don't do it. I want to take just a couple of minutes to walk through the logic train of why I disagree with James. I believe it's appropriate for the uh, Trump administration in its nuclear review, posture review, to explore options uh, for um, warheads uh, that may involve lower yields than typically available today. Um, this recommendation on low yield nukes is controversial, uh, as Rebecca has pointed out because it's viewed as a repudiation of the Obama policy. I don't believe it is, but we can leave that for later on discussion. It emer has emerged, however, from a realization that the global security environment has evolved significantly since the 2010 review by the President, by President Obama. Uh, and it's degraded significantly. Uh, in this regard, there is no reason for us to assume that the nuclear force that deterred adversaries and assured allies then will automatically do so today. Opponents argue that low-yield nuclear weapons blur the line between conventional and nuclear warfare, undermining deterrence by lowering the threshold of nuclear use and making nuclear more and more likely, and I believe this, uh, this assertion is not empirically based. In previous decades, the U.S. had thousands more tactical warheads than today many with much lower yields than we have today. Such warheads were deployed at the height of the Cold War but never used, even in confrontations where their use would not have necessarily provoked a Soviet response. There is no evidence that the simple possession of these weapons during the entire period of the Cold War made U.S. use more likely. It is also argued that low-yield warheads are for war fighting, not deterrence. And once any nuclear weapons used, escalation to global holocaust cannot be controlled. Indeed, many of the U.S. nuclear community see great risk that a limited nuclear exchange would escalate. If our nuclear armed adversaries shared this belief, then certain of today's nuclear capabilities might not be needed. Several, including Russia, as seen in recent doctrine, modernization programs, and military exercises, seem to believe otherwise. Indeed, Russia's leaders are behaving as if they truly believe that nuclear war could be controlled. Very importantly, what matters in deterrence is not what we believe. After all, we're not deterring ourselves. It's what the adversary believes. A failure to deter could occur if a potential U.S. response to limited use was not credible. Exploration of low-yield options, therefore, is about deterrence, first of all, and not war fighting. What is or would not be credible? Consider a Russian low yield strike on a European port that killed few, but seriously disrupt disrupted US plans to reinforce an ally, a Baltic ally under assault. Would US retaliation involving multi-hundred kiloton warheads and the potential for substantial casualties be credible? Would a broader spectrum of strike options make its response more credible? Question mark. As a result of such concerns, as James has pointed out, the U.S. has retained low-yield warheads for delivery on strategic bombers and NATO fighter aircraft. Ongoing modernizations for the bomber leg of the triad will preserve such options for the future. U.S. strategic land and sea-based ballistic missiles, however, do not have low-yield warheads. If they did, it would permit strikes anywhere in the world with much reduced unintended casualties within tens of minutes of a decision to execute forces. This capability could be achieved with a small, relatively low-cost modification to existing warheads, not new warheads, without requiring underground nuclear tests. It would strengthen deterrence of aggression in certain instances, I would argue. It could also strengthen efforts to assure allies of U.S. commitments to come to their defense. Implementing such an option is, 
has the potential for causing a, uh, a disruption to the, to the political consensus. And therefore, if the administration decides to go forward with such an option, it will need to have a clear, concise explanation of why this is essential for U.S. security and why, uh, and, and, and to be able to explain that clearly to publics because we didn't do such a good a job on that as James has pointed out with regard to the RRW and the RNET program. Thank you. There's a lot there. I'm going to remind, I'm going to suggest to the panelists what I'm going to do um, is we're going to go to the other two questions directly, open it up to some questions, but I'm going to reserve about five minutes, uh, five or six minutes at the end and, uh, and offer a chance to the panelists to respond um, in particular in terms of what do you think is most critical in terms of the consensus or challenges in the overall discussion. So give you a few minutes there um, for wrap up as you're planning ahead. All right, well, there's clearly divergent views on the issue of new nuclear capabilities. What about the issue of deploying additional uh, nuclear capabilities into theater? Clearly over the decades since the end of the Cold War, movement has been more in the other direction, reductions in Europe and, um, and the full withdrawal of uh, permanently deployed capabilities from the Republic of Korea. Obviously, there's been some discussion that perhaps that needs to be revisited in some way in either a temporary or a permanent basis. Um, what I'm going to do, if I may, uh, John, if it would be okay to turn to you first on this one, and then I will go to Rebecca and then James. Uh, like deterrence, uh, when we talk about the issue of assuring allies, uh, it's in the eye of the beholder. And the our allies are ever becoming ever more mindful of the dynamic threats in their regions. Some, like Japan, have reacted strongly to North Korea's nuclear tests and missile launches. They constantly seek assurance in every form and venue of the continued U.S. security commitment. Some, like South Korea, have shown interest in exploring an increased U.S. regional nuclear presence in their country. Both countries have latent nuclear weapons capabilities. And that, by, and that, I mean, that's characteristic of any country with an advanced industrial economy and with commercial nuclear power. If they decided to do so, they could design, develop, and field their own nuclear forces in a relatively short period. Today, U.S. assurance commitments and security commitments to allies mean they don't have to do that. To manage, therefore, a failure of U.S. assurance could have negative implications, not just for regional security generally, but for nonproliferation. To manage any negative impacts, decisions on adjusting regional extended deterrence must involve close consultations with allies. Indeed, the initial impetus, if it, to, if it is to occur at all, should originate with allies and not in either fact or perception from the United States as being foisting this upon them. Such decisions must also be accompanied by clear communication to publics of the threat that is being deterred and the potential for further degrading the global security environment. Now, what are the options? For Japan and the ROK, there are a number of options that could strengthen assurance. And these should be looked at in the Trump NPR. Let me just recount them very briefly. Restoration of nuclear weapons capabilities to carrier aircraft via the F-35 fighter. Restoration of nuclear slickums on attack submarines. Demonstration of a capability, not, not exercising the capability, but demonstrating the capability to deploy dual capable aircraft with U.S. nuclear weapons to forward bases in the ROK and Japan and actual regional deployments of dual capable aircraft to the ROK or Japan. These are the options that, that, that should be considered as part of, in a dialogue with allies. Uh, in NATO, where the consultation mechanisms are more mature and more fully institutionalized, <coughs> options could include increasing the DCA readiness posture in NATO and demonstrating a capability for interregional deployments of dual capable aircraft to the current non-basing countries in NATO. By that I mean non-basing of nuclear forces countries. Um, all of these are options that should be looked at. The degree to which they could disrupt political consensus 
can be mitigated by clear communication that the threat mandates this kind of action. Thank you. Rebecca. Um, I, there's little that I disagree there with, uh, with uh, Dr. Harvey's statements, um, but I just want to make a couple of points here. Um, I, I always find it so interesting that when you talk about nuclear assurance, and um, I have to be careful when I say introducing new nuclear weapons, because I, when I say that, I've gotten into trouble before, I'm not talking about um, reinventing weapons and deploying those, I'm just talking about additional nuclear weapons. So when, when we talk about this uh, in response to an assurance need, I find it so interesting that those who tend to be much more heavy on the arms control side of the spectrum um, than I am, um, make the argument that, um, that, there, that we would completely break the consensus developed in NATO if we do that, and so that we can't even talk about that or move that direction. And yet, um, when we, because many of our NATO allies don't want that, and then whenever we talk about the Asia problem in Japan and the Republic of Korea, countries that um, perhaps are wanting to talk more about this, um, then the argument always pops up, oh yes, but if you ask allies, assurance can be a sinkhole and you can just, you know, it's just a never ending thing that our allies could want that could actually, you know, to, to, that, would, that they would require to actually meet their, um, their assurance needs. Um, and so, I mean, I think what we, what we have to do is start from, again, um, as the, the last statement I made, you start from what is the goal? The goal is not just to limit U.S. nuclear weapons or U.S. nuclear deployments. That's not the, the goal that I'm starting with. The goal that I'm starting with is uh, deterring major conflict. And so if we're talking about, um, and then as a far, you know, second, secondary goal, nonproliferation, when you're talking about nonproliferation, what, has, what does the evidence actually support for, for non-nuclear weapon states actually not getting new nuclear weapons. And for those under the nuclear umbrella, umbrella it's, it's strong assurances from the United States. Um, and so because of that, our allies have a very strong say in this. What is required for their own reassurance so that they will not actually want their own nuclear capabilities? Um, um, and, and the other sort of ideas for what, uh, what, what constitutes non, you know, successful nonproliferation efforts are not actually based and supported by the evidence. That is the United States limiting ourselves, the United States um, sort of unilaterally putting uh, our own limitations on ourselves. Um, there is no evidence that other states have been inspired by that and therefore have done the same. But, but the evidence does support that as our allies um, are reassured, then that's when they forego and continue to forego their own um, nuclear capabilities. So having said that, um, uh, and, I, and I do believe that it should still remain the goal for the Republic of Korea and Japan to not uh, not obtain their own nuclear capabilities. That, that, that should be something that the United States should uphold is, in, is critically important. Therefore, what is it that is required? And so, um, uh, I do think that many of these things uh, should be discussed seriously with our allies. And I, and I will say, for anybody who has spent time, as I have, discussing with our allies, um, it, it, this, this is the next step before they start having very serious conversations within their own countries about getting their own domestic capabilities it is the United States deploying possible, you know, dual capable or nuclear capable um, uh, weapon systems. Um, and um, as we've seen, uh, the United States flying bombers so far north of the DMZ, you know, I see many folks here in the United States say, oh, it's just another show of force, it doesn't really mean anything. It has meant the world to uh, the South Koreans. Um, and so, um, again, uh, we, when it comes to assurance, we've got to listen to our allies. When it comes to the NATO issue, um, you know, I could spend a whole another, you know, five minutes talking about this, but I won't. Um, I would just say that uh, the threat from Russia continues to be real. Um, of course, our Baltic allies feel that more than the, more than um, some of the others, and um, so we need to listen to them as well in terms of what is required for their own reassurance. And um, and um, and again. Um, some of these things might might require the United States once again deploying um, deploying particular weapon systems to the European theater, um, having more war games that use uh, dual capable systems more visibly, um, and, and all of that can be again consensus can be developed and built among our, our European allies to move that direction for those who are still a little bit squeamish about that. But if the goal is deterrence, you start from there and you work backwards. And I think it's whenever we we sort of um, get our object objectives backwards that we start running into uh, into other problems. Thank you, James. 
So firstly, where we agree. Uh, deterrence is an important goal. Assurance is an important goal. No dispute there. Um, and I'm certainly not against doing more on both deterrence and assurance. In fact, when it comes to issues like the conventional balance in Europe, I'm pretty hawkish on, 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 on the need to address that at the moment, uh, as well as to take further steps to assure allies in both Europe and Asia. So there's, there's a lot we agree on. Um, the question specifically that Rebecca set us was about the deployment of further tactical nuclear weapons to Europe or, the de or, the, or their deployment to Asia. The question for me is, would this actually be effective in achieving deterrence and assurance goals? From my conversation with allies, the fundamental challenge that we face with assurance is whether those allies fundamentally trust the willingness of the United States to come to their defense. And they will point very explicitly to clear mixed messages sent out by this president specifically, though I would, very, though I would fully acknowledge that these are uh, 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 much longer running concerns that, 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 that have existed throughout many administrations. And my view is that um, I'm not going to argue the deterrence point at much depth, but you can, but on assurance, you can place as many nuclear weapons as you like, as close to adversaries' uh, territory as you like. But the United States is always going to maintain uh, the ultimate authority over their use. Even in a dual key arrangement, you still need the US to approve. And that will not demonstrate that the US is actually willing to use these things uh, in the most extreme imaginable scenarios. So I think that a lot of our deterrence and assurance measures um, are, um, um, should be much more focused on, 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 on demonstrating this commitment rather than on kind of um, uh, technical demonstrations. More than that, I think there are clear risks with announcing a policy of additional deployments to Europe or new deployments to Asia, because we may actually fail in achieving that goal. And if you've announced you're going to make those deployments and then you fail to make them, there are very, very significant costs. Um, you may fail because Congress refuses to appropriate the money, particularly if you're sending new tactical nuclear weapons to Asia. The costs of doing so are quite significant in terms of the storage you have to build. Um, you may get funding initially from Congress that, that then decides to reverse its decision. I mean, that wouldn't exactly be unprecedented in the history of that august body. Um, or Congress may appropriate the money, you have, may, may have no troubles there, and then you create enormous protests, particularly in South Korea, I suspect. You know, you saw the scale of the THAAD protests. Tact protests over the deployment of tactical nukes would dwarf what we saw over THAAD. What message are you then sending out from a deterrence perspective if you announce a policy of deploying these weapons and then you fail to do so? I would argue that is perhaps, well, I don't want to say the worst possible deterrence message. I can imagine worse. It would not be a good deterrence message. So, you know, it's all very well advocating ambitious policies, but don't forget there are very, very real costs to announcing them and then failing. Thank you. All right, I'm going to turn to the, the last uh, discussion, um, which is really on how should we, or should we at all, uh, limit, constrain, or prohibit additional arms control negotiations, particularly the extension of New START in light of noncompliance. If there were um, you know, legislative indicators on the first question about command and control uh, from one side of the aisle, there are you know, legislative proposals and others uh, from the other side of the aisle in this area. So uh, there's kind of one for each side. Um, so with that, what I'd like to do is um, perhaps uh, turn to Rebecca first. Okay, so um, on this one, I want to start off by saying Russia is still not complying with the INF Treaty. Um, and so until, um, I still believe it's in U.S. interest to try to force compliance with our allies of that treaty. Um, I do not think it's time for the United States to withdraw from the INF Treaty. I still think that there's some political leverage that we have there. Um, if we can, um, uh, so whatever levers we have remaining to pull to try to force Russia to comply with the INF Treaty, I think we should do it. Um, that includes uh, possibly research and development of, of um, of nuclear weapons that we can introduce to the, uh, to the European theater. Um, I'm not talking about deploying, uh, you know, um, INF violating 
weapons to the European theater, but I think that we should consider those. Um, at, because what we're trying to do is look at the buttons that Russia doesn't want us to push in order to threaten to push them to force Russia to, to comply with the treaty. Um, having said that, I think that um, the, the days of arms control negotiations with the Russians until the Russians prove that they can uh, abide by treaties um, are over. Um, but um, as for a new, new start specifically, this is a treaty that was negotiated um, it went through Congress, it passed Congress, it was ratified. This is a treaty that the United States, um, we, that the Obama administration went through the appropriate processes. And um, the, the, many of the Republican senators who had issues with the New START treaty uh, forced the Obama administration to, in exchange, to, to, to agree to the treaty to fully modernize our force. That was part of it, led by Senator Kyle. Um, and, um, and the Obama administration uh, did do much of that, and I think that there's areas where we didn't do as well as we could have done. Um, but that is the agreement that was made with Congress and with the President and with the Russians. Um, I've long said that I did not think that the Russians would actually, by the time the treaty went into force, that, that they would be in compliance with the treaty. It looks like now, according to Chris Ford, that, 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 they, might, that they will be. Um, they're at least headed in that direction. Of course, there's still time with the Russians, so, um, so we'll see. So if the Russians, um, uh, I still think there are loopholes in the, in the treaty, and I can go on with the problems I see in the treaty, but if, if, we, if all of the evidence shows that the Russians are complying with the New START treaty, um, that would be the one exception, I would say, for, for an arms control situation, which, uh, which an, a possible extension would make sense for the United States. Um, but, but that would be it. Um, and, and, and I'm not entirely convinced of that, and I'm willing to be persuaded either way. Um, but, but under no situation, I think, would the United States be interested in, in entering, neither are the Russians, by the way, interested at this point in negotiating another arms control treaty um, going down to, 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 to lower limits. It would just be an extension of the current treaty. Okay. James, why don't I turn to you, and then you can wrap this one up, John. Yeah, I mean, I think Rebecca's final point that there's no chance of getting another arms control treaty right now is exactly right. I think there are arms control treaties in theory that would make sense for both countries, but it ain't going to happen. The question is whether we preserve New START. Um, the State Department said in its most recent compliance report that Russia was in compliance. Uh, Russia has to meet the numerical limits. I think it's February 2018. Uh, it's seen very big reductions in its force over the last few months, and it's well on track to meet those. And I think especially at a time when Russia is modernizing its strategic forces so rapidly, uh, New START is very strongly in our interests. Think about how much more worrying Russia's strategic modernization would be without the transparency and verification provisions brought about by New START. Um, New START was also this critical part of the arms control for modernization consensus. Uh, and I think if New START is not extended, in particular, if Congress doesn't approve funding for the extension of New START, which is the way it could throw a spanner in the work, I think that really would compromise democratic support for part of the modernization agenda. Um, I think we should deal with INF as a separate issue. As Rebecca has said, Russia is violating the INF Treaty. Uh, and I'm actually critical of the Obama administration for not doing more on that. I think there was a lot more that could have been done and I think that still should be done uh, before we take the steps of developing systems that, if deployed, would put us in non-compliance with the INF. Uh, I think it would be a very good idea to uh, deploy uh, more sophisticated cruise missile defenses, particularly the Patriot Pac-3 capability, uh, to Europe to defend against Russia's INF-violating cruise missiles. Uh, I think it would be a good idea to deploy conventional cruise missiles, uh, air-launched in particular to Europe, in order to impose costs on Russia for its violation. Uh, I think it would be a really good idea to try and release more information about Russia's violation, so it pays a diplomatic price for this violation. I think US allies should start complaining publicly and also privately when they meet with Russian officials about Russia's violation of the, new, uh, of the INF Treaty. Uh, and I think there is a kind of face-saving arms control way out for the Russians. Um, without going into a huge amount of detail, Russia has complained about US compliance under INF. One of those items is not crazy. Some of them are just ridiculous. One of Russia's complaints is not crazy. And I think that we could deal, if, if, if we should say that if to Russia, if we're willing to deal, we will deal with your complaints if 
you're willing to deal with our complaints. So I think, you know, I think, I think, there, is an, I think there is a face-saving solution there. Russia probably won't take it, but I think it's in our interest to put it out there. But in any case, I think we should, we should, we should act robustly against Russian news, uh, INF violations, but we should not um, uh, throw the baby out with the bathwater and um, spite our, cut off our nose to spite our face to mix metaphors by uh, giving up on New Star. Thank you. John. Uh, I think uh, that um, it would, uh, a decision on whether or not to extend New Start based on INF is, is, uh, is, is one that we can push for the next uh, uh, year or for the next review. Uh, I don't think it's something that should be taken on now because we have time. We don't have to, we don't have to make a decision to extend uh, soon. Um, I think our main issue is how do we respond to the security implications of Russia's INF violation? And ideally, we'd like to get them back into the treaty. What happens if they don't? What does the U.S. do? Does the U.S. Uh, uh, take steps along the lines, some of them along the lines that uh, James has uh, proposed? Uh, or does it um, go further? Uh, a response uh, to Russian uh, noncompliance could be a U.S. noncompliance system in Europe, a land-based, restoring land-based uh, cruise missiles or Pershing II variants to, um, to Europe. I don't think that's the best way to go. Um, I think, first of all, that, uh, as James said, it, there is a strong potential for disrupting the public's on another nuclear deployment decision uh, in, in Europe. And uh, that's something the Russians uh, would, would welcome. Uh, why give them that? What I'd rather see, in my own personal view, is a, uh, an appoint, uh, a response that the Russians will pay attention to. Um, and they have always expressed concerns about U.S. nuclear submarines with short range, with shorter range sea launch cruise missiles, nuclear sea launch cruise missiles. I think we should consider strongly restoring that capability uh, to the U.S. arsenal. Um, in any case, um, we have time to work the problem, uh, and I don't think this needs to be on the agenda that could cause a disruption in the, in the FY18 or FY19 uh, modernization program budgets. Thank you very much. Well, it's clear, even on these four questions, we have a lot of range of views up here on the table, and I suspect even more in the audience. So I'd like to uh, get to bring you in. We do have um, microphones. I see one uh, here in the front, one over here that we'll get ready. Um, so uh, Bernadette, you can bring one this way and, and then one on this side. I'm, I'm gonna say, though, as, you, as the microphones get in place, I do detect um, actually a bit of a theme in terms of areas to pay attention to in terms of preservation of consensus. Um, and interesting, they're not so much substantive as perhaps procedural. Um, I think on the one hand, when um, there are a lot of things that may be politically, ideologically, or in some cases even policy desirable or preferable, but maybe not essential. And maybe those are ones that deserve a careful look while we focus on things for which there's an argument that something is technically, operationally, or strategically required. So let's focus on the essentials. The second thing I would say is we probably want to be careful when we're using nuclear weapons, which are our nuclear weapons policy is clearly fraught enough <coughs> and far too important to turn into a political football. So we need to be careful when appeals go to emotion or go to symbolism, um, and we need to deal with actual gaps in real processes and make sure that solutions are applied to the problems where they belong. And I think that that is a principle to help preserve consensus is critically important. The final one that has come up on many of these cases is, and it relates to the prior two, which is we need to understand who actually has the, the responsibility and where is it shared? Is it Congress? Is it the executive branch? When are both needed to either stop something or let something proceed? If you can't bring an idea to fruition, because you're not either going to be able to fund it or get the bill signed or other things, then again, are we just engaging in a debate that becomes more of a political football and trying to score political points rather than actually working to accomplish specific things that absolutely need to be done? 
Um, I guess I'm just a believer in being practical. So I think those are important principles that even where you disagreed on the substance, I feel like I detected those commonalities coming across all three of you in many ways. So with that, we'll turn right here to the front. Please state your name, your affiliation, and um, keep it a very brief question so we can bring several in. Thank Hi, uh, my name is Sandra Lita. I'm a freelance writer. My question is, I'd like to get the opinion of all the speakers where um, the success of the U.S. defense in terms of nuclear program lies in the superior nuclear ability and our ability to police the world in terms of geopolitics. But the next step, too, is about the biochemical weapons. We have seen Syria use that on their citizens. North Korea is developing sarin gas and other biochemical weapons. So where are we in terms of biochemical weapons? If the, if the, if the other countries head towards the direction, are we ready to defend ourselves and to deter threat, as you said? Okay. I'm going to take a couple of questions at the same time, um, and so we can kind of go to the panel. Yours next, please. Okay, so um, I'm Kieran, and I'm a student at Thomas Jefferson High School. Um, in terms of um, the possibility of threatening to deploy or deploying nuclear weapons in, um, in East Europe, I believe you said, uh, in, in violation of the INF Treaty, in response to Russian violation of the INF Treaty, how do we prevent personal politics between President Trump and Putin from getting in the way of our, our goals <laughs> privately in that session? Okay, and I'll do one more over here. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. There's been no mention of ballistic missile defense. As someone who both in the State Department and the Pentagon spent the last 40 odd years dealing with Moscow, you could not have a discussion about these strategic and nuclear issues without discussing ballistic missile defense. So could I ask members of the panel to do so? Great. So kind of cross area, you know, nuclear deterrence versus ChemBio, I think we've got a piece there, personal politics versus policy and kind of individual decision maker dynamics, um, those are clearly in play um, in these issues, and then missile defense, I, obviously that's a huge topic, we're not going to cover that topic, um, we had to pick four, but to the extent you want to declare the consensus buster aspect of it, I'll ask you to comment on that, um, so if I may. Um, <laughs> focusing on the consensus aspect. Okay, Rebecca, you first. How should I do this? All three, am I gonna hit all these Whatever questions? Whatever you wanna hit there is good. Gosh. I know you're gonna to wanna to talk missiles next. Okay, um, we'll start with that since that was the last one. Um, we're talking about nuclear weapons today, but of course uh, deterrence requires the entire strategic posture of conventional nuclear ballistic missile defense, um, missile defense just generally, not just ballistic missile defense. Um, and so um, that is a whole nother three hours of discussion. Um, I would just say that, um, of course, the United States must have a robust missile defense system. I'm not talking about the other, you know, sometimes the, the far arms control side likes to sort of characterize um, myself and some others who are um, big proponents of a robust missile defense, of thinking that missile defense is going to be the silver, silver bullet that's going to end all wars. Um, that, of course, is not my position. My, my position is missile defense has developed uh, extraordinarily, um, uh, especially in the last 10, 15 years, missile defense capabilities. And so we should build on those capabilities that we already have. Um, to Rebecca's um, theme of the day, there is broad consensus now that we've proven these capabilities with the Aegis weapon system, with the ground-based mid-course defense system, um, of, of the operationally deployed ground-based interceptors that are currently deployed in the ground in Fort Greeley, um, in Vandenberg, uh, five out of the last six intercepts have been successful. I know everybody likes to cite that with, you know, looking at the entire test program of the system. But five out of six, that's, that's extraordinary. And the last intercept that we had was with the most sophisticated complex threat um, that, that we've ever tested. So um, with that, um, with the recent news that this administration is expanding in capacity and also working on the reliability and the sensors, et cetera, I think that's all the right way to go. Um, I do not think that the United States should ever under any circumstances, consider trading U.S. missile defense capabilities with the Russian Federation or with the Chinese. Um, those two issues, um, the, both of those countries like to use mis missile defense to do that. Um, I think that that's a mistake. We're in the new missile age. We need to expand missile defense capabilities and look to see how those can complement our, 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 uh, our offensive strategic uh, uh, capabilities. 
Okay, that's, I'll put that one aside. Um, I didn't say my most controversial thing, but um, perhaps we'll save that for another day. Um, 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 uh, and, and I would just say, too, that the, the Congress, with the support of Democrats, changed the National Missile Defense Act. To, we took out the words limited. So now it says the United States is, is free to move forward with building um, the capabilities necessary to defend ourselves and our allies. It's no longer a limited missile defense capability. It's, it's to, to the extent we can have sensors, et cetera, um, to do that, then, then we should move forward um, and do that. Um, and there was another one that I really wanted to hit. Um, and, and, uh, your point, I think, was very, very important on chemical and biological. If you notice whenever I talk about deterrence, I don't say that nuclear weapons are there to only deter the use of nuclear weapons. I don't, I don't say that. Others do. I don't. What I have said is nuclear weapons are there as a last resort. Hopefully we will never have to actually employ them. We're using them right now to deter conflict and assure our allies. But the reason that we have them, and the reason they have to be credible, which is why I do support low-yield tactical nuclear weapons, if, in fact, that's what's required to change in the calculus of our, of our adversaries and required to assure our, our, our allies, um, the idea is to deter mass conflict, mass war. And that can include the entire spectrum. And that's why I think if you just sort of, if you think about just nuclear weapons, you're sort of missing the point, because the human capacity to build very, very dangerous weapons is great. And if it's not nuclear, it's chemical, it's biological, et, et cetera. Um, so I hope that answers your point. And then I, I just wanted to touch on yours, but I don't remember what it was. Yeah, I would just say, look at, the, look at what the United States is doing. This administration is pursuing uh, an agenda that if you just look um, from expanding missile defense, from fully modernizing the nuclear force, um, from opening up energy markets in Eastern Europe, um, from trying to um, broker deals in Syria that, that are in the U.S. interest, um, from looking at closing the gaps in the JCPOA, the Iran deal, all of these things um, drive the Russians nuts. And that hasn't affected U.S. policy. I think we should focus on that. Um, and I hope that I have time to respond to James's couple of points that he made, but maybe at another, at the end. Okay. We'll do that. Okay. Uh, regarding ChemBio, I want to build on Rebecca's uh, remarks. Uh, President Obama, in the previous nuclear posture, you had the opportunity to make a, a decision to state that the sole purpose of U.S. nuclear weapons is to turn nuclear attack. He did not make that decision. He declined to, to, to state that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons was to turn nuclear, which, which creates the uh, which creates a vision in the mindset of our adversaries that potential, a devastating biological attack on the United States or one of its allies could conceivably be met with a nuclear response. That's the only conclusion that an adversary could take. Uh, and um, to the degree that that supports and sustains deterrence, I think it's an important decision. If I had to guess, I believe uh, that President Trump will sustain that decision. Uh, with regard to um, the, the TJ request, the TJ student, does your uh, teachers know you're over here today? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> that was a rhetorical question, okay. Um, look, I, uh, I'm going to take a little difference with Rebecca here. I think that there is really an issue here that, I, you know, the president has a different perspective on Russia than many, many members of his party and indeed many within his administration. And that's going to complicate this kind of uh, discussion uh, in terms of, for example, responding uh, to um, INF violations and things like that. Uh, the president may not hold that level, that issue to the same degree of, of priority that he holds other issues, and he may make other decisions in, along these lines. So I think it's an open question. I think it's a good question, too. Let me, let me be very brief. On missile defense, and it's an appropriate question given the president has just submitted a $4 billion request for additional missile defense spending. Um, there is a consensus around the existing program of missile defense. Um, I don't think asking for more money to build more interceptors 
in Alaska um, is going to undermine that consensus. There is a legitimate debate to be had over whether that's the best way of dealing with the North Korean missile threat. Um, I disagree with Rebecca that there is a consensus around the efficacy of the ground-based mid-course system. Um, I think the tests are highly scripted, unrealistic. I, you know, let's, let's not get into this technical debate now, though I will very happily if you want to. Um, but, um, you know, asking for four billion more for additional interceptors, I, I don't think is a consensus buster. I think the real consensus busters are issues around things like boost phase space-based missile defense. Um, in answer to your question, Kieran, I mean, just very briefly, the INF Treaty does not prohibit the deployment of any or all nuclear weapons to Europe. It is no, no signatory to the treaty can possess medium or intermediate range uh, ground-based ballistic or cruise missiles, actually irrespective of whether they're nuclear or non-nuclear armed. Um, but that wasn't your main point. Let me say this. I think US-Russia relations are going to get significantly worse over the next year or two for reasons that I probably don't need to spell out in front of this audience. Incidentally, this is why I think if we're going to do New START extension, we actually have to do it sooner, because I don't think we're going to have the political opportunity to do it much further down the line, by the by. US-Russia relations, I think, are going to significantly deteriorate in the coming months, uh, years, year or two. I think this presents us with a nation of a profound challenge. On the one hand, we have to stand up against Russian interference in the election. We have to meet our defense commitments around the world against vis-a-vis -vis Russia, but particularly in Europe. We also have to manage the Russian relationship in a constructive enough way that we don't end up all dying in a nuclear war. And don't laugh, because I don't say that with any remote smirk and, and, and without any hyperbolicness whatsoever. How we manage that balance given the growing Russia scandal that the administration finds itself embroiled in? I have no idea. But it is a profound challenge for our nation as a whole, and one that I think every part of it, from Congress through to you know, ordinary citizens, are going to have a role in working out how, to ha how we get through this. But I think there is a huge problem here that is coming. Thank you. Um, I am responsible for keeping us on time. I'm going to try to take a couple more questions, turn it back to the panel, um, give them a minute both to answer um, as they see fit from the questions, and if you want to tag on a quick comment to, as your closing comment, you may do that. Um, so let's see. I've got, all right, I've got a, a hand here, right here in the middle. Um, I've got, I can beat you right back here. Um, one right here, if you don't mind. Oh, one right here, Chris. Okay, so those will be the three, and I'll start at the left. Okay. Uh, I'm Meyer Talheimer with the Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation. Um, I have a question about launch authority. Talk right into the mic if you want. I, I have a question about launch authority. It seems like there's a widespread consensus that launch on warning is a desirable capability, at, at least in part in terms of the timeliness of response. Sorry, desirable or undesirable? Uh, desirable among the panelists. Um, so my question is, under what scenarios, specifically to uh, Rebecca and, and Dr. Harvey, uh, do you see us needing to be the first to escalate nuclear use um, without a consultative process, especially given the U.S. Uh, superiority in conventional uh, counterforce capabilities? I'm just going to, um, so as we think about that, you know, uh, because it's a big topic, we are going to stick to the current policy, as we have the ability. If we were to move away from that, what would be the implication? Um, okay, Chris? Chris Conant, uh, Air Force Fellow. So, in trying to build a consensus, sometimes it's good to try to say what things aren't. So my question is, centered around the relationship of deterrence and arms control. Is nuclear deterrence built to prevent arms control or proliferation, or is it not necessarily built or shaped for that? I like the comment Becky made about it's not there to defend against a nuclear attack, it's there to defend against war. But as it relates to nuclear deterrence or modernization and arms control, is it how does that play out is my question. Does that make sense? Great. And then the last one over here. Dave Crandall, uh, independent consultant, retired from Department of Energy and NSA. Uh, my question deals with low yield nukes and our needs for them. Uh, I found John particularly persuasive, but I wasn't persuaded. <laughs> uh, two issues that I think should maybe have some discussion. One is, isn't our astounding conventional capability 
adequate to respond to some of the kinds of low nuke adversaries that might exist, low yield nuke. And two, is it worth pushing that issue, given that I think it's a really sensitive subject on the bipartisan consensus, and it, it might damage the bipartisan consensus. So do we really need nuclear low nukes uh, technically and politically? He's at the lower yield nuclear okay. weapons. Do we need low yield? I, I think in the, in the, and if I may, in the question, is, our, our, is your question also, do we have, is our conventional forces, do we have adequate conventional forces that can respond to this so that we don't have to go that direction? Is that the is correct? That, that was one of the questions. Okay. okay. The other one was, does it damage the Right. Well, okay. So. That's, we're back to the core question. Okay. So what I'm going to do is uh, turn to you, James. Um, to kind of make your last remarks and answer as you can. And we'll go straight down the line and we are going to be right on time. Thank you. So, Maya, I know your question wasn't addressed to me. Let me just say, the question of whether you support launch on warning is a different question from who you think should have the authority to use nuclear weapons first. Um, and and, 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 and um, I, you know, I, I, I would distinguish between those two things. Um, let me just talk briefly about low yield nukes. I am actually somebody who thinks that if a nuclear weapon was used by another state, the United States, I mean, against the US or an ally, as opposed to in another circumstance, but the US would almost certainly want to respond with a nuclear weapon. Um, we may have overwhelming conventional power, although you know our conventional margin is, we don't actually have a conventional advantage around the Baltic, and Lord knows what's going to happen to our conventional advantage vis-a-vis -vis China long term. But you know, I think, I think there is a very strong argument to be made that if somebody else uses a nuclear weapon first, it's likely, I wouldn't say certain, but going to be desirable to use a nuclear weapon in response, lest the adversary keep escalating and escalating and escalating. Um, that said, again, I come back to this point, we already have a low-yield nuclear weapon. The B-61 is a low, the low-yield option on the B-61 is a low-yield nuclear weapon. And my challenge for um, 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 my co-panelists is to be more specific about what your case for low-yield nuclear weapons is. Specifically, what are the specific scenarios in which you think existing capabilities would be inadequate? I'm obviously not going to have a chance to come back and respond to them. But I've noticed that when advocates for low-yield nuclear weapons make their case, as you both did, it gets into very abstract terms very quickly about circumstances may exist in which the US has to demonstrate such and such. But what are these specific scenarios in which existing low yield capabilities would be inadequate? John? Regarding uh, the uh, comment from our Air Force colleague, um, thanks for the question. I don't think there's one shred of evidence that anything the US does with regard to restraint, with regard to modernization, with regard to its stockpile, has any impact at all on co countries' decisions not to acquire nuclear weapons or to not cooperate with the U.S. on a strengthened nonproliferation regime. On the other hand, I do think there is evidence that the U.S. paying attention to its deterrent, including appropriate modernization, has been a major factor for nonproliferation in Europe and Asia. With regard to the um, issue of launch on warning, I agree. I mean, if, if the, the president has to have the opportunity to make a decision to respond before uh, enemy ICBMs strike the United States, absent that, there's no, uh, an adversary could think that he could eliminate a major U.S. response capability, and that would, that would weaken deterrence. Um, with regard to low yield, I think the president and his team should dis discuss these as part of the nuclear, in the nuclear posture review. I think they offer certain advantages, in particular the area where we don't have low, low yield today, which is on our strategic ballistic missiles. And a question will be, uh, we'll have to make a decision about whether the uh, uh, 
whether the military utility is worth the potential disruption to the um, uh, consensus on the fragile consensus on modernization. And I think it's probably, a, um, I, I would tend to err on the side that modifying an existing warhead that would not require a nuclear test to provide a capability that we don't have today, which is a, a lower yield option for our strategic ballistic missiles, there's a rationale to do so, and there is a, um, uh, I don't think it will disrupt our, uh, our modernization program. Um, that's it. Thank you. I'll try to go as quickly as I can, Rebecca, for you here, because I think we're out of close to, out of time here. Um, I, I did want to make sure that I went back to that second, I think it was the second question, um, to just to clean up my answers so that there's, there's no confusion there. Um, I liked the point that Rebecca made when she talked about where our consensus was that the United States shouldn't be, nobody should be making, um, uh, suggesting initiatives or supporting initiatives for the sake of scoring political points when it comes to nuclear weapons. I think that that, that should be clearly um, um, stated. Uh, I do think where, where James and I might disagree is just where we, um, we might disagree on what would be considered a new capability or a new nuclear weapon. Because um, I do think what, what is being considered before the United States now is to, to uh, is to, is to refurb and modernize the nuclear force based on current needs that, that the military um, has deemed necessary. Uh, so I think you know, if there was a new initiative, for instance, to, to create a completely wholly new nuclear capability, um, I, I just haven't seen, I haven't even seen that being suggested. Everything that I have seen being suggested falls within um, what I would consider just necessary to, to refurb and remodernize the current nuclear force. Um, to answer James's question, which I think is a very good one, um, the reason so many of us can't list out very specific scenarios is because when these things are discussed, it immediately goes classified. And I know that is annoying and it's frustrating, but that's just, that's just the situation that, it, you know, that, that is before us. I just hosted um, General Hyten, and, um, and when we started to talk about this particular scenario, when we were specifically talking about LRSO, many folks who have a problem with L LRSO just insist that it's a redundant capability that we simply just don't need. Um, but, but then I have been reassured and I have been in briefings in which there are specific situations and specific target sets that the United States needs to get to and it can't get to without the LRSO. That's just a reality. Um, I also think it's important to point out that for the purposes of our discussion, we're sort of, we, when we talked about consensus busters, we talked about sort of pushing, which, which systems sort of push and um, make the United States nuclear deterrent stronger and better. What we didn't talk about much was um, the pull we have coming from the other direction to break consensus to, for instance, drop the, the, the land-based leg of the triad, um, to, to drop the LRSO, to, um, you know, to put more further constraints on um, forbidding testing um, in the United States, et cetera, you know, making it more binding um, than, than, we currently, than we currently have on ourselves. And so, it, it, so it's good to remind ourselves that, that the consensus busters come from the other, the other directions as well, and they continue to do that. Um, uh, so I think consensus is good, um, I, but again, this administration has the prerogative to do what is necessary um, to, to, to create a robust nuclear deterrent with the goal um, of, of deterring mass conflict um, as, as I see it. And I, and I also wanted to make a couple last points uh, on this stuff because this is so important with what's going on with North Korea and right now in the South Koreans. The reason that the South Koreans expressed any, any pushback on the deployment of that THAAD battery, the US THAAD battery, was not because they were afraid that it would upset the North Koreans or would create a de more destabilizing situation there. The South Koreans are being held hostage by massive um, conventional nuclear force from the North Korea. They have for many years. Uh, that's not the fear. Uh, I thought McMaster put it so well that North Korea is responsible for the aggression. They are the aggressors. It's not the United States. It's not Donald Trump. It's North Korea and Kim Jong-un. The, 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 the problem the South Koreans had was the pushback it received from China. And China um, implemented to punish the South Koreans for accepting that deployment a massive embargo, or, or, or not embargo, but a um, boycott on South Korean goods, which punished the South Korean people. So I think that um, you know, we have to consider the political dynam dynamic there. And what the United States can do to sort of mitigate that problem is to demonstrate to the South Koreans that we are the better ally to them and it's not China. And so that the United States needs to expand cooperation where we can for assuring our allies deploying defenses where we can as well. Um, 
Um, and my last point on a technical matter, this, 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 the $4 billion um, re request that the administration just sent over for emergency funding for missile defense, of course, wasn't just for GMD. It was for the Aegis weapon system, more SM3 block, you know, 2A interceptors, et cetera. My only problem with that was it's peanuts compared to what the United States should be doing, given the current threat um, before us. And so I think that um, we will see um, in, the, in the coming years that, that there's going to be a lot more money for missile defense, as there should be. All right, well, this has been a rich dialogue. As we sort of uh, hinted at in this last panel, we could easily have had eight potential consensus busters. We had to winnow down to four. But what it does mean is there are really important issues in U.S. nuclear policy, and we're going to have to find a path forward if we want to be able to have a robust deterrence and a safer world that promotes nonproliferation and arms control as well. And there's a mutual dependency, and I personally believe consensus is a path that creates the road to progress. And so we have to just keep working at it. And I want to thank the people at the table here and each one of you in the audience who are doing your part to be smart on these issues, to study them hard, to understand other perspectives, and to look for ways to build roads together so that we can advance this. This has been an important area of national security where consensus has been present, even when views are strongly divergent. And we need to be proud of that and keep that going. So with that brief commentary, please join me in thanking the panelists.